All right, so thanks very much for having me today. I'm um, Scott Cowens from IBM here in Perth. Um, and obviously here to talk to you about artificial intelligence and what that means for us. So as you can see from that video, um, we're doing a lot of, lot of work in this space. But the video started with Thomas Watson, who was sort of like Steve Jobs uh, in the early part of the 20th century, very instrumental at IBM. And many of you may have seen this before. It's quite famous in IBM, this concept where uh, he had on his desk, think as a simple uh, statement. And that really drove a lot of what we've done here. It's about, again, from that quote, how do we solve all the world's problems through just applying thinking? So the way we do that at IBM is we are uh, one of the biggest employers of researchers in the world. Um, we have five Nobel Prize winners, for example, on staff who all won their Nobel Prizes for work they did here at IBM. Um, and we also have the most patents uh, of any company in the world and have done so consistently every year for the past 20. So it just shows the sort of research efforts uh, that we're doing. So in terms of artificial intelligence, we, our point of view at IBM is probably a little bit different. It's not so much around artificial intelligence. We've done a lot of work in that space, but really what we're looking at now is augmented intelligence. So it's how we as humans can actually achieve a lot more through the potential of having computers uh, behind us effectively. And let me show you some of, the, some of the work that we're doing around that to put that into more context. So let's assume that you are a caseworker in child protection. Uh, you're in the Armadale district, you wake up in the morning, put your iPad on, sign in securely to the Case Advice app, something we developed with Apple. Very simple user interface. It comes up with some pictures. So what's happening here is something we call next best action. In the time that I just logged in, what the computer system's done is it's looked at all of the records associated with all the children under your care in that area. So we don't have this in Western Australia yet, it's a, it's a research project in the US, but it goes into police records, school records, health records, corrective services, etc. And it says to you, based on an assessment of those hundreds of thousands of documents and looking at all the linkages around that, the best possible thing for you to do as a child protection worker in this area is to see these people here. So I then go in, Obviously, this is demo data. Click on a person. And what I'm then able to see is the relationships for that person. So what our artificial intelligence may have done there is said that there's an aunt of that particular person, there was a police incident last night that's then put that person at risk. So you can see the power. It's not the computer then saying, here's what you need to do, because that's really the expertise of that caseworker who understands all of the cultural attributes and all of the things that caseworkers need to do. But what we're able to do is to give that person the confidence that the system's gone through and looked at every potential linkage. And whenever there's an incident in these sort of areas, the same as in, in justice or defence, it's always very easy to say, oh, well, you can just join the dots. There's five things that everyone should have seen. But the mass of data makes that impossible. So that's really where we're applying what we call augmented intelligence. So that's what we're doing today. I'll give you more information on that and talk about Watson, which um, is very topical at the moment, our cognitive computer. But the subject was artificial intelligence, so I will sort of go back to the start and take you through what we've done within IBM around AI. So back in the 1950s, UWA actually had one of these machines. It's still over in the School of Computer Science. Some of you might have seen it. Um, one of our uh, researchers decided that if we could beat a human at checkers, that would be a good way to prove artificial intelligence. So we took the Connecticut State Checkers champion and we were able to beat him. Um, and the mathematics behind that were quite formulative, particularly around optimization of, of algorithms. Um, so again, some of the pure research that we were able to apply. In the 70s, by 1973, we were able to build this typewriter with a robot. The interesting thing about this is as you were feeding parts in for the robot to build, you could misfeed the parts and the robot would detect the misfeed, correct it and continue working. So again, things that are mathematically uh, quite difficult. By the 90s, we thought, and I might upset some people here, checkers is a bit easy, let's try backgammon. Um, so we then went and, and had a computer program that tried to, uh, to beat people in backgammon. Now what was interesting about this is that by the 90s we had the computing power to effectively just use brute force. So all we were doing was running millions of simulations of backgammon games. The only real um, 
uh, data that the, that the system was getting was a binary win-loss decision at the end and just throwing random strategies. But because we were able to try every single strategy, we were not only able to beat people at backgammon, but we actually changed the game to a large extent for people that play um, competitive backgammon because there were strategies that the system thought of that we had actually not thought of as humans. And this is one of the fundamental sort of philosophical things around what we're doing in this space, that the bias that we inherently have, and again here at UWA, Helico back to pylori is probably the best example of where as a research community, everyone thought, well, stomach ulcers couldn't be uh, possibly you know, caused in that way. And then obviously Barry was able to go and prove the difference around that. So um, what we're doing in the computer has no bias. It will look at every potential option um, and then come back with this with this uh, type of thing. So we killed backgammon, that was good. We then moved on to chess, the, the grandest of, uh, of board games. Again, the Go enthusiasts will argue with me, but we got into chess. And most people here probably remember Deep Blue, the late 90s, and poor old Gary Kasparov, again, got beaten by the, the computer there. So these grand challenges, it seems pretty much everything we do, we've got to win a game to be able to prove it. And that's all well and good, but then what, how does that relate to the, the real world? You know, it's one thing to beat Gary at chess, but how do we actually use these in the real world? So all of the learnings that we had out of that, we were then able to apply um, from the late 90s onwards uh, in a lot of areas. So technologies like this are now sort of quite old, but um, are still in use. So this is what we call Data Baby, Toronto Children's Hospital. Um, and what this baby is, the baby's hooked up to um, some monitors. What's interesting about this is we have over a thousand different data points every second going through for that baby. And because there's so much data going through, what our systems are doing is monitoring that and calculating that in real time. So we're able to track an infection before it becomes clinically present and we're then able to obviously intervene in advance. So again, all of those technologies that came out of how do you beat checkers were then able to be applied to how do you save babies. Um, smarter cities is another area where we're doing a lot of advanced work in this. So we're able, for example, with cities that work with us around this to look at weather events and we can see 72 hours in advance at a road level, so a hyper local level, what's going to happen in, in weather in that area and what the impact on that road would be. So we can then tell an ambulance in a cyclone, for example, that road's clear, but we're actually going to divert you five minutes around that because the odds of the road remaining clear are quite a bit different. We can also do things where we start to put feedback loops in. So we probably all use Google Maps. Yep. And we can see real time traffic with that. But what we're able to do is to use some of these systems to change traffic. So where smarter cities apps are used by local governments or the equivalent of our main roads here, what we're then able to do is to say to you, in your particular area, we're going to direct you to go this way to work and we're going to direct someone else to go this way to work instead of us all just using a GPS that puts us all down the same road and creates a traffic jam. So we can be quite smart as to how we start to, um, to move these systems as well. Education is another area that we do a lot of work in. So we've got a technology called learning in the cloud. And again, that brings our analytics to how we do education. So we can tell from a range of factors in advance if a particular individual is going to potentially fail a course or not achieve their full potential. So it might be an A student that goes to a B student. Either way, we want to intervene around that. So the analytics can tell us that's going to happen. What we then do is put those feedback loops in place. So we're then able to work with teachers. So again, let's give you a real example of this. So let's say you're out in Mekathara, you're a starting teacher, um, you've done a, a, or you come from, uh, say, uh, English as a second language and a Vietnamese background. So you have some, some expertise around teaching language skills to children, but you've got within your class eight or nine different learning difficulties, and that's only one of them. So in this system, you would join a professional group that then starts to develop curriculum materials based around learning uh, mathematics, for example, with English as a second language and Vietnamese as a primary language. You might have someone else that's got expertise in autism, for example, and they'll do work around that. So the teachers are then able to use their areas of interest and professional expertise to really change people's lives, but we're able to bring data together to do that in a mass way. Um, so that's something that we've uh, deployed quite successfully, not here in Western Australia yet, but in other parts uh, of the world. 
Here in WA, pretty much the story of WA, of course, is these things. So Rio Tinto are using these sort of algorithms in great depth for asset optimization and for us to tell when a hall pack's about to break down and how to work around that. Um, and obviously places like retail, banking, we use it as well. So that's sort of where artificial intelligence has come from. There were a lot of smarts that went into that. But to an extent, it was quite easy because we were dealing with structured data. So for a computer to be able to look at numbers, that's one thing. The real challenge was then when we start to talk, and 80% of the world's data is unstructured. So this is my uh, four-year-old. He's currently learning how to craft insults. One of them is, I smell with my nose, you smell with your feet, my feet runs, your nose runs. So a four-year-old understands that, we understand it, but for the computer, what does that mean? Um, and the amount of work that goes into having a computer understand that. This one does. This is Watson, named after Thomas Watson, who you heard at the start of that video. Uh, it's actually about the size of two pizza boxes now, so it's not as big as it was, but I like to show the big picture. Um, how many people have heard of Watson here? Okay, great. It's getting quite a bit of press, obviously. So as you may know, the thing about Watson is it can perceive, relate concepts, reason with them, and it's constantly learning. So it is starting to think like we think as humans. So again, to prove Watson, we had to, we had to find a game. We couldn't, just wouldn't have been right if we didn't find a game. So Jeopardy was uh, the challenge we gave. And as you can see there, Watson was able to beat the grandmasters of Jeopardy. I love the guy here who says, um, I for one welcome our new computer overlords. And I'm sure there'll be a question on ethics in the question time that we can discuss around that. So, People here might not be that familiar with Jeopardy. I must admit I wasn't until we beat it. Um, I don't think, I don't even know if it's televised here. But these are some of the real questions that we were able to, uh, to win at. So if you look at the way this question's worded, and I'll read it out in case everyone can't read it, the four countries in the world that the United States does not have diplomatic relations with the one that's furthest, furthest north. So for a computer, a lot of concepts here. So let's think about how we solve this as humans and in fact, that's how we've programmed Watson to solve these things. So the thir first thing Watson does is it breaks it into two questions and says, let's solve the first one first. That's actually quite simple. It's able to go to a database, CIA World Factbook in this case, and look at who doesn't uh, the United States have diplomatic relations with. Um, anyone know this was the late night, uh, sorry, the early, uh, 2010 this would have been. Anyone got any guesses for? Yeah, so North Korea, Bhutan, so North Korea, Bhutan, uh, Iran, and testing my memory here, a fourth one. You got it right, obviously, with North Korea. So then the computer's able to say the furthest north, and it does that by looking at the geospatial information within it. So relatively easy, then of course it gets harder. So again, Watson was able to answer this one. So here the answer must be a rhyme, and it must be the most relevant rhyme. It's where Pelé stores his ball. So Watson's now got to understand what this sentence even means. What's a Pelé? Well, we can tell by his that Pelé must be a male. So it will then go and look for who is Pelé, have a variety of Pelés returned. Ball, from that, Watson can then infer, OK, we're talking about a sports person potentially, but it could be a twist, so we've got to look at a whole lot of other options. Um, so then it will come back and say, OK, I think we're talking about the soccer player. But then where he stalls his ball could be a box, a bucket, a bin, a locker. So what Watson now has to do is put each of them against the words and try and look for the best rhyme. But again, in Jeopardy, you can't answer it wrong. You've got to answer it right. So Watson's also thinking, if I'm not confident of this answer, I'm going to hold back strategically as opposed to answering. So in this case, it said soccer locker. That sounds like a good rhyme. I'm going to go with that. And it was the right answer. So you can see here, we're now starting to get pretty complex in terms of all the maths and all of the thinking behind that. Sorry, Scott, can I just ask, what sort of time frame on Jeopardy does Watson have? So it's a, it's a um, yeah, so it's milliseconds that it needs. And that's the other thing. All of that, all of the stuff we do in potentially milliseconds, it's got to do in that time frame as well. 
So then it gets even harder before and after goes to the movies. So what we need here are two movies that make a continuous sentence that makes sense. One is an earlier movie than the other one. So I need to know the chrono you know, I need to, to know the chronology of movies. I need to know all the movie titles. I need to know what they're about. Film of a typical day in the life of the Beatles, which includes running from bloodthirsty zombie fans in a Romero classic. So when we start to decompose this, you know, who's Romero? What are zombies? Does bloodthirsty have anything to do with it, etc.? Does anyone want to have a guess at this one? Hard Day's Night. Okay, good. So that's the Beatles one. And then you need the, obviously, and Watson was able to say, oh, it's George A. Romero. Classic zombie movie. No zombie movie fans here? So the hard thing about George A. Romero, of course, is there was Dawn of the Dead, Day of the Dead, um, Survival of the Dead, Night of the Living Dead. So again, Watson's got to look at all these movies and figure out which is the right fit. So the answer is A Hard Day's Night of the Living Dead. And again, Watson was able to answer that. So you can see why this took us a lot of work to get this type of technology uh, running. What we do with that, the way Watson works, is the same way that Aristotle works and the same way everyone at this university works. It's by using the scientific method. So it's by coming up with assumptions and testing them and um, saying these are, these are the theories that hold and this is the one I have the most confidence in. So is that based on searching, just searching the whole range of Yeah, so let me take you through how, how it actually does that because I knew being a university people would want to look under the hood. Um, <laughs> So apologies to those that aren't of a sort of scientific or technical bent, but I, I, won't, um, I won't go into it too much. So effectively what it's doing is it's first of all analysing that question, is it easy for me to answer this straight away or is it a question that I'm going to have to decompose and do some work around? And that's where decomposition comes in. Now again from there, it might be something that is very easy for it to answer. So it can actually just go straight to a hypothesis based on knowledge that's effectively in system. Or it can say, hang on a sec, I'm going to have to go to an answer source, like the CIA World F Fact Book, or whatever else you put in there. So the interesting thing about Watson is it has no filter of what's true and what's false. So as an exercise, we actually pointed it at some Usenet groups and then asked it questions like, when did man land on the moon? And the answer was he hasn't landed on the moon, it was a conspiracy. So the curation of information becomes very important to make sure what we put in there is actually factually correct. But when you'll see some of the examples, when we start to get into clinical systems where we're putting journal articles in, we can't just put every journal article in, not only because some journal articles may be false, but more because there are better or more relevant articles and therefore we've really got to curate very strongly that, that corpus of information. So that's for our answer sources and our evidence sources. So it'll then go into the answers, do a search, come up with answer generation and then form some hypotheses from that. In soft filtering, filtering, it's really about optimization, so it'll throw out the ones that are obviously not going to make the cut. And then it will start to score those hypotheses. So again, what it's doing here is going back to further evidence. So it's saying, I think this is valid, this concept of, of North Korea, for example, but let me look at some other information around that. Let me check that North Korea hasn't suddenly established diplomatic relations with the US. Let me look at the context around that. All of those various things. And then what it's doing is it's giving us scores. So it will never say I'm 100% sure the answer is X. It will say here's a percentage range. And again, we'll then program it to say it's OK to move forward with an answer. So if you're talking about where D can use this to navigate around the campus, it's probably all right if I'm 70% sure the answer of where the ref is or when it's open is X, Y and Z. Um, but if we're talking about a clinical system, we want to have a much higher, you know, the, the high 90s in terms of our confidence level around this. Um, and then from there, we synthesise. Um, we all can also have some additional training around that. So again, that's used in oncology and areas. Final merging and ranking and the answer. All that's happening in milliseconds. Um, so you can see it's really, if you think about it, that's, that's how we think as humans to a large extent. And we've then been able to mirror that. But as humans, we get information continuously. Yes. Yeah, so it depends on what we're doing. If it's something where it's OK to be wrong, then you can just feed in from the web. But typically what we're doing is we're updating the corpus on a regular basis. So it might be a nightly update or it might be a monthly update if it's an area where there's not a lot of change, for example. 
Um, so it does, it is constantly learning and constantly having new information put into it. The hard part and the part why, quite frankly, those systems are reasonably expensive is because you have to be curating it all the way and you need humans to do that because a computer system's never really going to be able to, I mean, we do, there are some smarts around how Watson will do some self-curation, but at the end of the day, um, an oncologist is best placed to say that's the most credi credible journal article in this space, for example, or, or credible piece of research, or that person's been discredited, don't listen to anything they say, <laughs> those sort of things. Just wondering if um, Watson has then swallowed some incorrect facts information? Mm. So I think the next slide we get into that. Yeah, so the next slide's a good example of this. So Memorial Sloan Kettering is someone we worked with to do our oncology corpus and that was a process that took many years and many oncologist hours. So we do to try and get accuracy, particularly in these critical systems. There's a lot of work that goes around the training to, to avoid having false information in there. But remember also we're, we're not talking about the computer replacing people. So the, the computer's still just giving an oncologist um, advice and the oncologist will then determine whether to take that or not. And that's the final protection against the computer getting it wrong because it will get it wrong in, in areas. So um, after we won Jeopardy, we got a phone call from an on oncologist at Memorial Sloan Kettering, which is um, one of the premier uh, cancer clinics in the world, based in New York. And he said, look, this is uh, probably a macro of my bedside table. I've got to read 150 hours of medical journals uh, every single uh, week, and obviously I don't have time to do that. So I'm worried that there's things I don't know. Can Watson go and read them for me and tell me what I need to know when I need to know it? So as I say, we spent many years and quite frankly, billions of dollars going and, and setting Watson that challenge. And what we've now got is Watson Oncology. So what I'm able to do here um, is if I'm a hospital, and the interesting thing about this is it uses Memorial Sloan Kettering's curated knowledge. And the way Memorial Sloan Kettering does oncology can be quite different to places like Western Australia for a whole range of different reasons. Um, so this is mainly being used in countries where probably the number of oncologists is a bit lower and maybe the maturity of, of, of the practice is a, is a bit lower and they're saying we want to get MSK uh, information uh, and that's really, it's, it's having that second opinion from someone at MSK that's the value for us. Um, so what we're able to do here is we can take an electronic medical record or we can put information in ourselves. You probably can't see this because of the size of the screen, but there's a number of little lines here saying derived. What that means is Watson's entered information that it hasn't been able to get directly from the source. So it said, for example, the HR2 status of this, um, it's a breast cancer patient, is negative. The reason it knows that or thinks it knows that is because there's something else in the primary source and using logic for that to be the case, it would follow that that status must be negative. But the reason it puts derived there is when the oncologist calls this up on their iPad, they have to go and approve each of them. So again, we're getting, we're not doing treatments based on data that may be incorrect. We want to get an oncologist to confirm that Watson's made that logic uh, correctly. So what we do is we hit, hit derived and accept that. There may be ones where it goes straight through. We then send it off to Watson. And in seconds, we then come up with two things typically. One is clinical trials that are available to that patient and would be suitable based on the medical record. So again, what Watson's doing is it's understanding all of that medical history, looking at all the clinical trials around the world, typically hundreds of thousands of them, and saying here are the two or three that are most relevant to that person and that they're likely to be accepted for. And then it actually comes up with a treatment. So in this case, chemotherapy, um, followed by surgery, et cetera. So again, personalized around that person's profile. What it's done when it's come up with that treatment is it's looked at the knowledge of Memorial Sloan Kettering. It's looked at the knowledge from journal articles, from research papers, from all the sources that it has available, about 200,000 different, different sources. Um, so it comes in and it says, uh, okay, here's, um, here's, here's what we recommend. You'll see here, there's different colors. So green is, I have the most confidence around this. Orange is, still confident but a bit less. That might be because there's drugs that aren't on the pharmaceutical benefits scheme but the patient might privately want to pay for that, those type of things. And then red is, these could be relevant but I'm pretty sure they're not for various reasons. But again, it's showing all of them so that the oncologist is able to make a decision 
because it may be that this is most relevant for that patient with the knowledge the oncologist has. Um, it also gives timeline and other data based around this, which aids in the selection. So I go, okay, this is fine, chemotherapy, dose dense AC, that's great, but I actually want to find out why. Why does Watson think that? So I click on the blue button and it then comes up with a summary that says, this is my rationale for thinking that. So watching oncologists, you know, they'll, they'll say, oh, typically I would have done that one. Why is it that one? Oh, okay, yeah, I wasn't aware of that paper. That's really interesting. Let me research that and see the relevance. Um, what you can then do is look at all the additional publications and you can go right back to the source with this uh, that may be relevant. You can then look at the drug administration and the drug information. So a whole lot of data for that oncologist in making that decision around the treatment plan. Um, if they accept that treatment, they can obviously make amend, amendments to it, they can accept it, it then goes into the medical record and you then have this pop-up that allows you to say, this is what I want to share with the patient and then that, that information either goes to a printout or an iPad app or however the hospital deals with information to that patient. So the patient's then a lot more informed as well about the treatment and some of the information around that. So what this is doing for places, particularly where it's being used, where as I say, they have a limited number of oncologists, it's really able to help them achieve significant productivity in the way that they're working. Um, and it's also meaning as, as cancer treatment gets very, very specialised, people that are generalist oncologists can start to get quite specialist knowledge from somewhere like MSK to assist them. And this is really what we're talking about. It takes that individual, that one oncologist, it enhances what they're doing, scales it by bringing significant amounts of data and then really accelerates their learning. So from a teaching perspective, I mean really I see that as a teaching tool, particularly in medicine where you know, doctors are always learning, but th this concept of being able to accelerate knowledge very quickly through using um, cognitive systems is what's really exciting for places like UWA. So we then took that into research because we've done all this work around educating Watson around the corpus. So let's now look at research. So this is where we're able to, um, to look at potential areas of research by being again very thorough. So when we use the Barry Marshall example, there are areas researchers will just have a bias around saying, I don't think that there's any value in doing research in this area. Well, what Watson will do is look at every possibility and then come back and say, actually, we think there's something here that you may have missed. Um, so what we're doing in this space is we're bringing data. It's only used in the US at the moment. So bringing data from the FDA, animal models, chemical compounds, as much genomic information as we have, <coughs> drugs, all of these different areas. So we're able to look at all of the ways that they interact. And what's interesting about this one, um, I'm sure as I say ethics always come up in these discussions, but from IBM's perspective, when we first started doing genomic research, we're like a university in that we have to have ethics um, guidelines around the work that we do. So we said, you know, we're going to get information about people here that could potentially be used to discriminate. So what we're going to do really early on, and we were the first company in the world to do this, is to have HR policies around not being able to discriminate against people based on genomic information that we have out of them. So the ethics is at the heart of the way that we, um, that we do this work. Um, it's then used in police forces. So again, just like a doctor, if you're doing a major fraud or a murder investigation or something like that, you've got 15,000 or more pages of information you need to go through with all these relationships you need to figure out. Watson's very good at going and doing all of that. And again, not saying arrest this guy, but saying here are the areas that we think you would be most productively spending your time because here are some relationships that you might not be aware of. Um, everyone always likes to make money, so it's been very popular in financial services in terms of obviously going and looking at um, uh, analyst reports and financial data and running across that. And here in Western Australia, Woodside are using it, and they're using it in ways that are totally unique in oil and gas. A lot of them are, 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 are very confidential to Woodside, really at the heart of their strategy. Um, one of the areas they do publicly speak about is the ability for them to get corporate knowledge from all of the engineers that have gone through Woodside and to be able to transfer that knowledge to younger people. So again, that concept of having that acceleration of training uh, at Woodside. So it's exciting for us to have a Western Australian company in that industry at the forefront of um, the way these technologies are being used. Um, so we have 36 countries, 17 industries using cognitive computing today. Um, 
It's all based in the cloud, so 1.3 billion queries are sent to Watson every month. Um, and in a whole lot of areas, I won't go through them all, but um, in fact, you may or may not be able to read this, but as you can see, a lot of different areas uh, that it's being used in. And we expect in five or 10 years, this will be just like the maths that we did in artificial intelligence, where it's all over our supermarkets and our cars and everywhere else. Cognitive will also be everywhere. Um, so underlying all of this, when we did Jeopardy, we effectively had five areas. Natural language processing, machine learning, question analysis, feature engineering, and uh, ontology analysis. So they were the sort of core areas behind all of this. What we've now got is all of these, 28 new APIs, and we've got another 50 coming by the end of 2016. So we are spending billions of dollars adding to this so that we're able to put a lot more information in. So one of the ones we did in, in this batch is personality insights, for example. So we're now able to, um, to look at personalities of people and say, here's potentially a way to communicate to that person based on their personality when you have to tell them this information that we found from the cognitive systems. Um, so you can imagine in law enforcement and a whole lot of other areas, that'll be quite useful. Um, and then these are all the technologies that go behind it. So you can see it is, um, it is a lot of work that we've, we've put in around all of this. So where to next? That's really where we're at at the moment. The next great area for us is in personalised healthcare and what we call the health cloud. So um, as you can see here, 300 million books of data, 1 million gigabytes of health related data for each of us. And we're all using Fitbits and these type of things now. It's only going to get more in terms of what we collect. So with, with Watson Health Cloud, what we're now doing is we're trying to tie all of that information together. So here in Western Australia, for example, we have the RAIN cohort based here at UWA, one of the world's great longitudinal studies. Um, we've got about 25 or 30 really good clinical studies where a lot of data has been collected over a long time, but a lot of these are effectively siloed and any researchers that have tried to access these, it's always quite difficult to get the data out, out of these systems because of the security and things that need to be around them. So with Health Cloud, all of that information sits in the cloud and is able to be securely shared between researchers that have access to de-identified data, for example. But you then have open data that you can share with the public around trends and these type of things. So what we're really talking about is in a secure way, freeing up this data to allow researchers, individuals and government to start to make evidence-based decisions, to start to change clinical practice. Um, also, particularly in the US, but increasingly in Australia, we've got health insurance companies um, and startups getting involved in helping around this as well. So the concept being that, um, you know, I go for a jog, I've got my Fitbit on, I'm feeling fine. There's no medical evidence to say I'm going to have a heart attack. But based on some information that Watson's able to pull out, based on people with a similar genomic profile and similar age and everything else, I'm actually, even though I'm feeling fine, just like Data Baby, before I'm clinically present with that issue, the system knows I have an issue and tells me to go and get treated for it. So that's really what we're trying to do with this. And it's funny that those trucks that we showed you in Rio Tinto, we probably have more information on the health of a truck than we do on the health of any of us. It's sitting there, but we haven't just been able to bring that together because of legislative and a whole lot of other, other areas. So we're working around that and that's really um, the, the holy grail for our technology. We've set a target that within five years, so it's about four and a half years now since we set that target, we want to have this available to consumers in terms of treatments that are based on your genomic information. So we can be very, very specialised, particularly in areas like cancer, where we can look at your DNA and give you a treatment based upon that. Um, so we, that's really, we, we didn't do a game this time. We said, let's, let's do something that's maybe a, a bigger challenge. Um, so that's where we're at. Now, as I say, a lot of these systems, the big cognitive systems are multi-million dollar systems and they take six to 18 months to train and, and, and to implement. Um, but you guys being at a university are probably saying, hey, I wouldn't mind uh, going and playing around with some of these, how do I do that? So we can share these, these links, but also if you want to take them down. We have a technology called Bluemix and um, this is a freemium product, so you can use it for free and then if you want to use it a little bit more for commercial purposes or whatever, you can pay for it. Um, and what it does is it gives some of those APIs that we've developed for Watson so you can start to play around 
with uh, machine translation and question and answer and relationship extraction and some of the algorithms that we've developed around this. Um, we also have hackathons and these type of things to, communi uh, to uh, get um, people that are startups or students involved in this. So here at UWA, we do work around uh, getting uh, secondary school girls into STEM. Um, in West Perth, we have over 100 computer programmers that export some really interesting code out to um, IBM Worldwide. And we've got a lot of really smart women in that group. Uh, and they're very passionate about obviously getting, getting more girls into STEM. So that's something that we've had a great relationship with UWA around and these are the sort of tools we make available around that. Sorry? Can you just explain the API? So they're packaging particular contextual pocket packets of information? Yeah, so it's really running it through the algorithm. So if you look at um, the, one of the ones is the personality insights. So let's say that you're doing a, um, a website, let's just use something that's not that complex. So you're doing a website for shoes. You, you, you've decided to do a startup around shoes. So what you want to do is when people come in, um, you can take 250 words of text or you might take their Twitter feed or their Facebook feed. And based on that, we can then run it through a psychometric profile. So the API is to run it through the psychometrics. You then don't have to build the algorithm and everything around that. And it will then come back and say, here's some psychometric data based on that person. So you may then want to market this particular way to them, you know, as opposed to someone else. Um, so um, that's, that's one example of, of how it works. So the good thing for people that are students and, and fairly early, um, or developers that, I mean, often students are more advanced than a lot of people, but people that are at early stages of programming development, is you don't have to build a lot of these things. You can literally just plug into them and have them run this, this for you. Um, so feel free to have a look at that. For those of you who um, are teaching here, there's something called the Academic Initiative, um, and you can again just sign up for that. You can then offer Bluemix, some cognitive computing tools, a whole lot of cloud-based tools to your students free of charge, so you don't have to go and build the environments for people to do this. And then we also have a lot, whole lot of courseware there. So if you wanted to do a cognitive computing course, for example, we have a whole lot of material that you can use uh, in, your, in your teaching uh, practice. Um, as I say, as well as giving people access to uh, the software to, to play around with. Um, and some parts of uh, UWA are already, already using um, Bluemix and the Academic Initiative. We also have Watson Analytics, and um, this is where, again, we use some of the simpler areas of Watson. So I can just upload some data into Watson Analytics, and what it will then do is um, allow me to ask natural language queries. So I can throw you know, my daughter's basketball team up there, say who scored the most goals, and from that Excel spreadsheet it will come back and give me the answer and a nice graphic around it. Um, so again, something that's interesting to play around with. There are commercial applications obviously around this. Again, at a university, many of you would be familiar with SPSS, which is a much more advanced version of this, so Watson Analytics is very much more of the entry level, um, but still quite interesting in terms of what you can do with it. Um, and that's another product you can access for free um, on, a, on a trial basis. So um, that's where we're at. Cognitive is definitely the future, so hopefully with some of those tools. Um, the challenge we say is outthink your limits and go and see what you can do with it. So questions? Yes? I was wondering yeah, how far actually you pushed this Watson to handle a question that not only uses the explicit knowledge but implicit knowledge as well. Sure. So when it's doing derived in oncology, that's really where it's it's trying to figure out answers based on what it already knows. So you could argue potentially maybe that's part of implicit knowledge. Um, it will, the, the way we typically train Watson is to give it about 2,000 question and answer pairs and, and that's a human, you know, giving it that information. And from that, it will then self-learn. So it will again start to, to um, have some implied knowledge out of that. Um, we do have uh, a journal that I can send through the link to as well that goes into all of the deep mathematics behind this. I'm a philosophy graduate, so I get a certain level and then it's just numbers to me. Um, so uh, I'm happy to give uh, that information to you as well. So I'll just send that through yeah. Lucinda. Absolutely. Any other questions? I was wondering sure. if uh, is Watson publishing anywhere, considering that it's crunching all this data and putting information out there? Um, so, I was trying to think about that, if we've done anything with, with actually having it right. Um, 
In fact, the most relevant for this, let me just see if I've got it on here. Um, so we do have something out at the moment, which is a little bit of a, a toy thing, but it's probably interesting. Watson Trend, here it is. Um, so what Watson's doing here is it's going through and advising you on uh, what toys to buy or what presents to buy for people for Christmas. Um, and what's interesting about it is it goes through some discussion groups which aren't really curated, um, but it gives it the information and it says this is what people are talking about the most in terms of what they want for Christmas. So the Nexus 9 tablet seems to be interesting. And what it's then done is written that text. Um, so journalism is certainly one of the areas where this will start to change things. Um, in terms of anyone using it on a daily basis, I'm not aware of a case study around that, but certainly this shows you that it does have the ability to start to, to do those summations and that type of thing. Um, this is on the Apple Store. It's called um, Watson Trend. So again, to download that and have a play with it. Um, and it's got some analytics in there as well. Good question. Good question. It's, uh, it runs in HTML5, so you can look at it there. But I, I feel your pain. I'm an Android uh, user as well. Uh, most of our things are Play Store as well, but I think that one is only, only Apple. Anybody else got any other questions? Um, so it varies depending on, um, there's not one instance of Watson. Um, so obviously if you're looking at things like oncology where it's a curated data set as opposed to building curation from the ground up. Um, typically at this stage though you're talking about multi-million dollar um, systems. Um, so we, we, don't, we, we actually go through um, a value assessment with the client where we look at exactly what they're trying to achieve. What we don't want is people that invest in Watson and then find that it was the wrong solution for them. So we do a lot of work about making sure Watson's actually going to be able to help you with what you're trying to achieve. And then we do a business case on the back of that. Um, but they are multi-million dollar solutions. Um, we are, if you look at what we're doing, you know, the, I think the hope from everyone is that we will have a lot more open systems around this. If you look at IBM generally, a lot of what we've done has been around trying to get our technology into, into open areas. And that's part of Bluemix where we're, we are opening up a lot of these APIs to people to not pay us any money and start to play with themselves. Um, the issue is, because of the curation, there's a lot of services we need to do around that where we're, where we're training the system. And when you've got people involved, it obviously becomes very expensive, particularly in Western Australia. Um, but again, you know, compared to some of the other systems, it's not, it's not like it's a ridiculous sum of money, I suppose. So to shrink it from refrigerators to a few pizza boxes. Yeah. Suggests your plans are replicated rather than just make it bigger and bigger and bigger. Yeah, so there's, there's not one Watson. Um, so you can run it on premise. Uh, if you want to take the pizza boxes and put them in your business, you can do that. Um, so every, every Watson is unique. Um, typically people use it in the cloud, so we have a number of those boxes, but you can um, yeah, put it in under your desk if you, if you so desire. What's the main use today? I mean, you've got the oncologist example, but is it research? Is it, you know, where, where you're talking about you're selling the solution for yeah. people to use? Where would be the biggest market? So it's mainly with organisations that do, that do want to be cutting edge with the research, um, and Woodside's a good example of that. Um, it's really anyone that has, um, you know, that, that fundamental issue of we have a tonne of knowledge and we need a way of curating that and being able to interrogate that. Um, so the main areas around it are financial services, it's been very strong with, with banking. Deakin University have, have used it um, uh, mainly around student information, um, obviously. How long have they had that initiative for? It's not that long. No, it's about um, uh, probably 18 months with, oh. with Deakin. Yeah. Um, what's interesting about Deakin is they got students to curate it, so it was a very good way. And I think that was part of the attraction to Deakin, that they then had students being able to curate the information and learn about cognitive computing. Um, healthcare is obviously one of the key areas. Um, intelligence and, and law enforcement um, is another one. Um, but as I say, we've got about 17 different industries that we're finding it for, retail as well. Um, so we feel everyone's going to start using this technology. Just to clarify on that, so just in terms of the accuracy of the mm. 
it almost sounds like it's important to compartmentalise the data for its different purposes. Yeah, so it's a good question. You know, you sort of think about this, could you have um, one big Watson that's an expert in, in everything? Um, I suppose if you think about that, some of the issues are, you know, the way an, econ an economist might tell you to treat cancer and the way a clinician may tell you to treat cancer could in fact be entirely different. So um, a lot of those, there would be a lot of those sort of issues you'd need to consider. Um, there's certainly in terms of general information, a lot of that is being put in, but when you get into the specialist information, um, a lot of it does come down to practice. So as I say, even in oncology, you will find that the way a group of oncologists in a certain um, uh, place do their work can often be quite different from, from other places. Um, and that's where you then, you then have people that are saying, no, we actually need our own, our own corpus. So when you actually go into detail on this, it's pretty much always people that are saying, we want to actually have our specialised knowledge in there, as opposed to getting generic knowledge. People always seem to go to the specialist. And just in terms of if you get a question, if you get erroneous information in there, how easy yeah. is it for Watson to unlearn? Oh, so it's easy to unlearn. Um, the issue is obviously picking that up and that's why we spend so much time on getting the corpus right to begin with. But you will get in, you know, obviously um, instances where journal articles looked fine and were very prominent and then someone was fraudulent and what was it, I think about 3% of, of research we're finding is in those areas. So that's that's a good example of where Watson then needs to unlearn that. It wouldn't be wise to use the Watson No, well the good thing with computers is they, um, they forget things very easily as opposed to us, because we can just take that data out and it's as though they never knew. Um, I think it was a movie around that. <laughs> yeah, um, you've seen, like, when you have a, an answer, it gives an answer, it gives us some evidences that you can request that information and yep. inform of where this uh, kind of knowledge was extracted. Yeah. But do you have a way of viewing the knowledge path in the form of graph? Yeah, so um, there are there is some work going on at the moment around what's called Watson paths. Um, if you Google that, or again, I can send some information through. Um, MD Anderson, another cancer centre, is um, the one working on this, and that does actually have a graphical representation um, that looks at a uh, particular patient um, symptoms and then sort of represents that in a graphical way. Um, that's probably the closest to what you're talking about. And then following on from that, what about seeing where that information is used and seeing then the results of that? Yeah, so this is the interesting part where at the moment you can say, um, you know, tell me how you came up with that. If you look at things like, and, and what we're doing in that learning in the cloud, the education solution I spoke about, that is more around structured data, although I think we'll bring Watson to it fairly soon. But what's interesting about that is it's not about us just being a passive observer of what's happening, it's about us creating the feedback loops. And that's really at the heart of what we're trying to do with all our systems, to say we can see the train crash coming and what we're going to do is use evidence to tell people that you've got to actually take an alternative around this. But again, letting people do that work, letting teachers be teachers and clinicians be clinicians, etc. And that's where hopefully these systems give them the information and free them up to not go and try and find the data, but to take the action. Um, and then obviously a big part of this is then tracking what impact that action had. So with learning on the cloud, it breaks down into cohorts. You then have research communities that go and do that work. You can then have different um, uh, you know, groups doing different things and then you can say, okay, this, just like we do in research, this is what's uh, most likely to have benefit and, and we can then put more uh, work into that. So from a policy perspective, this is quite exciting because you really, it's always about getting that evidence to say, if government spends X dollars on this, will it actually get the outcome? So again, learning in the cloud, has the ability to say if government will give us X amount of money as a school district to intervene with children with this learning disability, we can see from data that we will be able to uh, change outcomes. Um, but that stuff, as I say, isn't cognitive. That's, so that's a much cheaper solution and something that's been in, around for a while. Any further questions? Thank you all for attending. Thank you cool. all. Really appreciate it. I whisk up some propaganda for you. So this covers a little bit on what the university offering, some of what um, Scott's covered as well. And even if he sends me on any further information, I'll pass it on to the school. And I'll send my details as, uh, through as well, so feel free to contact me if you want any more information. Thank you very much.